We'd like to welcome you to our Water Resources Seminar Series today. Today we have uh, one of the students in our uh, slash water resources program who has a requirement to get his degree has to present a paper. And so today I'd like to introduce Marcus Middleton who got his BS in Range Management at the University of Wyoming and is completing his MS in Range Management at the University of Wyoming in Range Management slash Water Resources. He's from Dubois, Wyoming, and he said he just got a job in February at Cypress Yampa Valley Coal down around Steamboat Springs, and he says he's been busy with hydrology and range stuff ever since. So with that, I'd like to introduce him. His topic for today is salt content of sediment deposits along degraded and improving riparian zones in Wyoming. Marcus? Oops, sorry. Thank you, Vic. Um, being a student in this classroom last semester, I just have one request. If you do fall asleep, don't snore. Um, the topic of my presentation today is, of course, salt content sediment deposit along degrade and improving riparian zones in Wyoming. And by way of introduction, during the past decade, riparian zone management has been elevated in importance, primarily due to increased environmental awareness. This awareness initially took the form of attempting to prevent areas which looked like this from degrading and becoming areas that look like this. Couple this increased awareness and these efforts with our ever increasing problems of water quality and the need for states to develop non-point source pollution control guidelines and you have a situation ripe with research opportunities. One question which arose initially is, what effect do riparian zones have upon the control of non-point source pollution from upstream sources? Research along these lines primarily is dealt with sediment loading, such as you see here. But what about other constituents of non-point source pollution, such as nutrients or soluble salts, which are visible above the high water mark here? In order to address some of these questions and concerns, the Muddy Creek study site, located some 100 kilometers southwest of Rollins, was established in 1984. Through a cooperative effort, cooperative effort of a backward slide, private, state, and federal entities, including but not limited to stock growers, uh, grazing boards, University of Wyoming, the Water Center, of course, Bureau of Land Management, Department of Agriculture, and the SCS. Primary justification for the study was to determine the role of channel and riparian zone condition in controlling non-point source pollution from upstream sources. And secondly, to study the effect of in-stream structures upon the restoration and maintenance of cold desert riparian zones. The study site contains some 100 kilometers of stream channel and is possessed of highly variable hydrologic character. Historically, the hydrologic character of the stream has been controlled by active head cuts such as this, which it moved up through the valley. As a result, the Muddy Creek study site has been divided into six stream units or reaches based upon hydrologic character. Unit 1, which is not shown here, is the site of the active head cut, which you just saw. Unit 2 is a degraded stream reach characterized by incised channel, minimal inner floodplain development. Reach 3, I use the term unit and reach interchangeably, so forgive me, is a transition area. Beginning is degraded, going into a mudflat system, and finally beginning to turn to a braided channel as it enters an established riparian zone in reach four. This established riparian area is the result of historic water diversion practices and braided stream channels. Unit five again is degraded. An active head cut has moved up, had been stopped by a concrete structure and dike system. However, a couple years ago, it cut around the dike system and is now beginning to move up into the established riparian area. Lastly, unit six is the improving condition. Substantial inner floodplain development and is 
the site of ongoing stream restoration efforts using in-stream structures. Here you can see the resultant valley profile. Here would be another active head cut such as this, altering the valley profile. As you can see, we have a fairly steep gradient from units one through four. The head cut then comes in and the gradient is substantially less downstream from that point. This in turn affects sediment deposition and associated salt retention. The particular study which we're concerned with today had three primary objectives. First, to determine where the concentrations of soluble cations and nutrients in deposited sediments differ significantly between degraded and improving condition stream channels. Secondly, to determine whether the concentration of soluble cations and nutrients in deposited sediments differs significantly with bank position or level. And lastly, to determine whether the concentration of soluble cations and nutrients in deposited sediments differs significantly, significantly over time. A secondary objective of this study was to determine the most representative point of sampling for soluble cations in sediments deposited along meanders. To accomplish these objectives, the following studies, uh, study design was utilized. Three representative meanders were selected within both the degraded stream reach of Unit 2 and the improving stream reach in Unit 6. Primary considerations, representative channel conditions, a big thing was access year-round so that we could get data, um, proximity to the highway so that we could take in tours and such to see what we had been accomplishing on the ground. Three meanders were selected within each of these reaches. Each meander was then divided into three positions, these being upstream, middle, and downstream in accordance with direction of stream flow. The degraded channel, some two kilometers below the active head cut, which I showed you before, is characterized by minimal inner floodplain development. As you can see, it's almost non-existent. Short, steep riparian areas, such as this, contained within very high cut banks. As such, you don't get nearly the filtering effect and sediment deposition that you would expect with a channel in better condition. Because the riparian areas are so confined and integrated unit, each meander had the convex portion separated into two levels, these being water's edge and upper bank. Upper bank was usually at the very base of the cut bank as far as we could get it up. Three positions by two levels yields six plots per meander. Six plots per meander by three replicate meanders equals a total of 18 sampling points within a degraded stream unit. The improving stream unit, on the other hand, and I'll use the terms stream channel and riparian zone interchangeably when I'm talking about condition because they seem to go hand in hand, at least in this case, is characterized by substantial inner floodplain development such as you see here and wide, gently sloping riparian areas contained within relict cut banks. Because of the gently sloping nature, we were able to divide each meander into three levels in the improving water's edge, mid meander, and upper floodplain. Three levels by three positions yields nine plots per meander times the three replicate meanders, a total of 27 sampling points within the improving condition unit. Each plot, most of which looked like this, was sampled in June, July, and August of both 1986 and 1987 for a total of six sampling dates. Such multiple sampling necessitated this staggered sampling scheme in order to minimize 
impacts upon subsequent samples. June, July, and August, each plot followed this pattern so that the movement between points was equal each time. The resultant sampling hierarchy was for treatment, two levels corresponding to condition class, degraded versus improving, three replicates per treatment, the meanders served as replicate units, sample units were the plots within each meander, and subsamples were the sampling dates, total of six. Core samples were collected from the top six inches of deposited sediment within each plot using two inch PVC pipe cores with screw on lids. Samples were then removed from the cores and immediately placed into sealed Tupperware containers and placed on ice. Samples were then transported to the University of Wyoming Soils Laboratory the following day for subsequent soils analysis. Samples were analyzed for soluble cations, sodium, potassium, calcium, magnesium, nutrients, nitrogen in the forms of ammonia, nitrate, and total Keldahl nitrogen, phosphorus as percent phosphorus, total organic carbon, electrical conductivity, pH, and texture, percent sand, silt, and clay. These parameter values were then analyzed using the following statistics. We used the SAS version 5 general linear, general linear models procedure here on the University of Wyoming back system and performed analysis of variance using a 95% confidence level. We incorporated repeated measure statement to account for the effect of multiple sampling dates. Means for effects found to be significant were separated using Duncan's multiple range test, alpha equal to 0.05 and a correlation matrix was created to identify potential relationships between variables. Results. Um, one other thing I should point out for statistical purposes, the reverse button doesn't work again, main effects were date, condition, position, level, and replicate. The reason we put replicate in was so that if we did indeed have a gradient effect between the top and bottom of a condition unit, we could identify that and go from there. As the primary focus of the study were the soluble salts, we'll discuss the soluble cations last. Soluble cations, for purposes of this study, were considered to be representative of the soluble salt levels. As we discuss the results, please keep the following things in mind. In 1986, this is water center data from continuous discharge monitoring. Peak flow was 140 CFS in late May, tapered off to less than 20 CFS during June, July, and August. 1987, peak flow was 1,150 CFS in mid-April. Earlier, a lot bigger, almost a full magnitude of difference in the runoff. Tapered off to less than 10 CFS in June, July, and August. Both those years, in late July and the entire month of August, for the most part, the improving stream reach was dry, was not flowing, ponded condition only. pH, you can see here, condition by date. Blue, I don't know if you can see this very well, this is a bad slide. The aqua corresponds to the degraded. The red corresponds to improving. As you can see, there are some differences, but nothing significant came up. One of the first things that I think a person should look for in major differences between channel conditions is a shift in pH due to microbial activities. If you're getting more salts, you'll expect a shift in pH. Ammonia concentrations, you can see significant differences between years between sampling dates within years. These patterns of fluctuation here are primarily the result of microbial activity and plant uptake. Here you see in 1987 when we had such a high flow early on, we got a lot of organic material trapped in with the deposited sediments. Microbial activity started off fairly low, but it was, it was low in the degraded consistently 
compared to the improved. Improved trapped more sediment. So you get this stair stepping as once the microbial activity begins to take place, it just begins to exponentially grow. 1986, when we had a normal year, you got a big burst of activity, a large die off because they ran out of material, and again it comes back up. At least that seems to be the most plausible explanation at this time. Percent phosphorus, again, microbial activity and plant uptake will account for much of the differences here. In the degraded, you have a difference in texture, more sandy material, less clays. So you're not going to get the phosphorus deposition and retention to support major plant growth. Secondly, you don't have that much plant growth in a degraded condition, so you're not going to have the plant uptake that you would expect. Therefore, you can see we kind of have a little stair step with the improving, degraded, holds up, goes down a little bit with plant growth, and then comes back up with normal water flow, I would assume. However, in 1987, the big flow year, you start off fairly low, you go up high, probably pulling out the sediments which were deposited, the solution effect, dropping back off as plants take it up. Improving condition, you start high during the course of the growing season, decreases as plant uptake takes place. Now comes the fun part, soluble cations. As I said, we have sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. Statistical analyses were performed on them in the mill equivalent per liter concentration values. This was to give me a handle on an absolute number rather than milligrams per liter because that varies so much with your uh, atomic size. Milligrams per liter is a function of mill equivalence times the atomic weight, and that'll give you your milligrams. Anyway, grand mean values by date. As you can see, 1986, which was a normal flow year for our purposes, started off fairly high. July tapered off. August went sky high. Effective evaporative concentration and bank recharge. Here you're getting dilution as bank recharge is taking place. Once that bank recharge is exhausted, it goes up because of evaporative concentration. 1987, high flow year. As you recall, the peak runoff was in April. Flows decreased dramatically in May, whereas this year, in 1986, your peak was in May. You're getting evaporative concentration taking place much earlier. Also, the effect of plant transpiration and plant uptake of soluble salts is likely to blame here. Condition by level and condition. As you can see, degraded, had a much higher concentration of sodium than did the improving. And in both the degraded and improving channel, as distance from water increases, your concentration decreases. So the closer you are to water, higher concentration is going to be. For direct comparison, degraded is in aqua, improving is in the red. You can see a pattern of, again, dropping down with the dilution, evaporative concentration, evaporative concentration straight across. Degraded, there were significant differences within years and between years both. However, in the improving, there was no significant difference between years. To me, this seems to indicate that we are getting some permanent retention of soluble salts. Potassium. Again, condition by level, degraded had higher levels than did the improving. But something that was interesting and was totally unexpected, degraded, again, you had higher concentrations near to the water. Improving condition channel, the area right next to the water had the lowest concentration, and the concentration peaked approximately five to ten feet from the water's edge and began to taper off again. This is not a significant difference here. However, this is a significant difference. 
Potassium, you can see, again, your dilution, evaporative concentration. As you recall, the sodium in 1986 and 1987, peak values, concentration values, were reached in August of both years. With potassium, 1986, your peak is in August, but in 1987, your peak is in July. I think this shows the effect of a high initial runoff early and then extremely low flow values during the course of the year. You're finishing up your bank recharge if you have any left. You're getting your evaporative concentration. And again, if you're getting some fall thunderstorms, I would assume that's again the effect of dilution. Degraded, higher than improving in all but June of 1987. I haven't found a reason to account for that yet. That's part of the reason I'm writing a thesis, I guess. Calcium, degraded. The level next to the water was highest. As you can see, significantly higher in the degraded than the improved. The improving, again, the level next to the water had the highest concentration. Condition by date. You'll notice that calcium and potassium both followed the same pattern of uh, fluctuation, both in 1986 and 1987. Something that was interesting here, 1986 was significantly lower concentration in the improving channel than was 1987. I think that this is the result of having the higher flow value in 1987 and consequently a much higher volume of sediment deposition. Last but not least, magnesium condition by level, again same pattern, highest next to the water, tapers off, higher in the degraded than the improving. And again 1986 lower than 1987. A significant difference between years but not within years. Degraded condition, on the other hand, in all the cases of the soluble cations, every one of them, there was a significant difference within years and between years, which is something that cannot be said for the improving condition. Total soluble cations, then, as you can see, degraded condition, the pattern of your uh, Bank recharge, evaporative concentration. Here you're finishing out your bank recharge, evaporative concentration, and then tapering back off in August. Please note that the TSC concentration average for the degraded is 900 milligrams per liter of ex extract. Excuse me, can't talk today. Whereas the improving condition the average value is only 350 milligrams per liter. And there was no significant difference in 1986. There was a significant difference between June and or July and August of 1987 and a significant difference between years. Interesting. Whoops, it went the wrong way. Oh, great. Okay. Anyway, electrical conductivity corresponds very nicely with the TSC concentrations. We'll leave it at that. Keep from boring you to tears. Deposition values which were obtained between June of 1986 and June of 1987 correspond primarily to the 1987 runoff. The degraded stream unit trapped 1,625 tons of sediment correspondingly 1.85 tons of soluble salts. The improving channel, on the other hand, despite it being less than half the total salt concentration of the degraded channel, trapped 8,664 tons of sediment. Therefore, it trapped, again, nearly twice the amount of soluble salts. But it's not a linear relationship here even though it trapped, what, six, seven times the amount of sediment, it trapped less than twice the amount of soluble salts. So it is not directly related 
to sediment deposition in terms of salt retention. Reasons for these differences between the degraded and improved. Um, this study from, or this slide from a related study, shows the phreatic water surface in relation to the channel itself. As you can see in Unit 2, which is the degraded stream reach, the water surface, the water level for groundwater, actually intersects the stream channel itself. You get interaction with groundwater, you can get upwelling, the groundwater might be high in soluble cations, anions, therefore you get salt loading. Unit 6, I see I have a nice typo, on the other hand is a perched system. This is the improving unit. You get no interaction with the groundwater. This accounts for some of the great variation in the degraded unit from sampling date to sampling date, whereas this is pretty much an insulated system. What comes in either goes out or stays within the channel itself. That's why I felt when I stated that we were getting a fairly consistent level of uh, soluble cation concentration that I thought it indicated permanent storage. If you're not having a whole lot of variation in an insulated system, you must be doing something in terms of keeping it there because your concentrations in your water are going up and down the entire time during the study. Uh, unit four, this is just for your information, the water table is about six inches to two feet under the ground surface. Another part or another portion of a related study which can serve to help explain some of these patterns and fluctuations is vegetation. Here, the vegetation in the improving stream reach is significantly different from vegetation in the degraded stream reach, if you can find any vegetation in degraded stream reach. Take the kind of production you saw on the previous slide, equate that to transpiration, salt uptake by the plants, and compare it to here, where it's virtually non-existent, and you can see where the levels would be expected to be higher in sediments here because you're just not getting it taken out. Conclusions time. First, soluble cations undergo similar patterns of fluctuation governed by channel characteristics. Despite lower cation concentrations, the improving channel retained more salts as a result of higher rates of sediment deposition compared to the degraded reach. Improving condition riparian zones appear to be more effective in controlling non-point source pollution than our degraded condition riparian zones. Channels experiencing groundwater interflow, if you don't prefer the term interflow, interaction. I'm not sure if interflow is a correct term. I don't remember from, Vic says no. Okay, I flunked that hydrology test. <laughs> appear to be subject to larger fluctuations of ion concentrations than similar channels which are perched. Channel condition, bank position, and date appear to have no significant effect upon total carbon or total nitrogen levels in deposited sediments. As you recall, I showed you the ammonia concentrations. There were significant differences there. Nitrates, questionable. Total Keldahl nitrogen, which accounts for 90% of the nitrogen content in deposited sediments, there was no significant difference. Therefore, when you lump the data set, overall there was no significant difference for total nitrogen. Nitrate and ammonia concentrations, like I just say, were consistently higher in the improving condition stream reach. There were significant differences, but lump them with the total Keldahl, and they disappeared. Lastly, this comes back to our uh, secondary objective. The most representative, representative portion of the meander for salinity sampling appears to be mid-meander along the point bar or middle segment. Uh, a graduate student's view of Muddy Creek 90% of the time, waist deep and sinking fast. Um, there's a few things I'd like to mention. I kind of blazed through this. I glossed over a lot of things that came into play. Main effects, date as a main effect in itself, 
was significant, as you could see from our data set, or from the graphs, which are representative of the data set. Position, surprisingly, was significant in only two situations. The most significant thing that we found was level. Um, as you'd expect, in most situations, concentrations are highest next to the water because with soluble salts, that's where you get your saturated conditions. Therefore, you're getting a um, saturated solution, so to speak. Your bed load is not contributing that much into those sediments. Potassium was a big surprise. I don't know what is going on there. I'm currently working on that. Something else that was very surprising is suspended sediment load from water center data that I've been analyzing. There's not a real good correlation between sediment load in the stream and salt content of the sediments that are deposited. I, again, I think a lot of this is coming from groundwater, which is upwelling, coming in through the stream banks. Because the degraded channel um, contributes flow, contributes sediments, and contributes soluble salts downstream. The improving channel, on the other hand, is filtering out sediments, decreasing sediment load downstream, decreasing soluble salt load downstream. So I guess what I'm trying to say is we can draw some inferences here as to whether degraded versus improving stream channel conditions, what effect they have upon non-point source pollution. But because of the differences in the groundwater regimes, perched in the improving versus an interactive water table, you cannot say hard and fast, degraded is worse than improving, improving is better than degraded. You can't do it. You can make inferences, but beyond that, the only thing you can do is look for effects within each channel. And that's what I tried to present you with today was primarily the effects within each channel condition between dates. Um, on that note, I guess I'll open up for questions. If you guys want to throw things, feel free. <laughs> sure. Marcus, I have a real, uh, I I fundamentally don't understand what degraded zones and improving zones are. Why are they degraded? Why are they improving? Okay. The uh, commonly used terminology, a degraded streams zone, if you recall that first slide I showed you, the degraded, where I pointed out how steep the banks were, uh, there wasn't very much vegetation right next to the water, and I said there wasn't any inner floodplain development. Typically, an incised channel is one of the primary criteria for a degraded stream channel. That means that the stream has downcut your riparian area that was just right next to the water, getting plenty of liquids, plenty of food from the creek, whatever, however you want to put it. All of a sudden, that's gone. It's perched. It's not getting what it needs. Therefore, your riparian areas die. Well. In this situation, it's happened historically. Um, there's a lot of situations where you, uh, not to badmouth the railroad or the highways or anybody, but they build a road, they straighten out a section of the creek. It doesn't have the meander to cut down on the velocity anymore, but it's still got the gradient drop. That erosive power has got to go someplace. It's going to start a cut. It's just going to start working its way back up to the headwaters until it's achieved a gradient that is at equilibrium. Um, if you'll recall, the improving channel condition slide I showed you, we had those real nice wide flat banks and the creek was kind of meandering back and forth and had lots of vegetation stabilizing that. It's not established, it's still classified as improving because you have the relic cut banks containing the flow. If you'll recall, I said there had been that head cut that had moved up through there. And well, how long ago was that that thing moved through there? 20 years? At least 20 years. So you can see the effects are long lasting when something like that goes through. 
the active head cut in unit one moved 30 yards in a month this last spring. Sounds a lot. 87 was the big flow. You had cut a new channel in 87. Complete new channel about 10 to 15 feet deep and about 30 feet wide. Uh, soils out here are highly erodible. And uh, just for geology sake, you're, the uh, stream channels are bordered to the east by Tertiary Fort Union to the west by Wasatch Formation. So you have coal seams and such that are contributing salts and fun things like that. Other questions? I probably dazed and confused everybody. But. Okay, here we go. <laughs> One of your parameters was texture. I uh -huh. think we can get a little bit of an explanation of some things by texture. What did you find the texture of the soil to be? Okay. I kind of forgot that one. I was hoping you wouldn't catch me on it. But um, in the degraded stream unit, the texture class is, uh, I'm trying to remember the exact term, it's sandy. Really high coarse content, very few fines, no silt to speak of. The improving channel, on the other hand, has red wash and ephemeral drainage dumping into it. Really high clay content. We're getting a sealed stream channel in some instances. Scott Bowman put in some streamside pisometers six inches from the water's edge, and they were sealed so tight he didn't get any water into them during an entire growing season. And when you're not getting water movement through six inches of soil, your clay contents are phenomenal. Um, that in turn has a large effect upon cation concentrations and such and retentions. But the point, thing I was trying to point out is if we were getting the permanent storage, I would expect the uh, concentrations to be higher in the improving than the degraded. That's just my personal opinion. Okay, but by the same token, Taking a look at it, most of your sediment load is coming from the degrading section Yeah. in most years. Uh-huh. Right? Right. And most of that material is sands to maybe some silts, but no, hardly any clays. Right. What types of materials carry salts and hold salts? Well, clays, right? gee, Louie. <laughs> Admitted it's mainly your clays, clays that, yeah, clays, you know, but... really sock the salts and hold them. In other words, sands and stuff like that are not notorious for Yeah, well, that's why I'm saying. For having affinity for. The texture class combined with the groundwater interaction, I think, accounts for your large fluctuations in the degraded. The improving, like I say, with it having consistent levels throughout the season between sampling dates, even when there's a significant difference between years, I think that indicates that you are getting permanent storage with the deposited sediments. I probably made a bad job explaining that too. So if I understand what you said correctly about the source of materials for the improving section, most of the clay materials is derived from a separate source. And if, if that's the case and you have a higher clay content there, why do, you, why do you see lower soluble salts in that reach than in the degraded section? Okay, as far as flow from red wash, the ephemeral drainage, it only flows in response to precipitation events, usually large precipitation events. I sat down and figured it out. It contributes can't remember if it's 2% or 12% of the flow. It's not a very large amount of the flow that actually goes through there. Um, when red wash flows, you know it because it turns the creek red for the next 10 miles downstream, you can tell. But as far as the amount of material that's being deposited, a much higher amount, volume sediment-wise and such, is coming downstream from the degraded area where that head cut is beginning to move up. You get that sediment load coming in. It's got a higher clay content also, just because of the uh, area it's in. 
I don't know if that addressed your question, probably not. How did you define soluble salts in your study? How do I define them? Salts were, which are, I used a textbook definition, I believe. And I can't remember the exact wording. It was salts which were extractable under saturated conditions without vacuum or mechanical assistance, I believe. So there was, there was no chemical extraction or anything? It was just an aqueous? No, it was, what it was suspension. is uh, the UW Soils Lab performed all the analyses from that point. What they did is they made a saturated paste solution, which is one of the first things you learn in Soils 412. Get your hands muddy. And uh, they put it on a canister filter, took the extract out, and then they ran their analyses from there. What they also did at the same time is they uh, took the percent water at saturation. That's how I can convert these mill equivalents per liter values. I can eventually get to parts per million values, which is how the uh, tons of salt per amount of sediment which was deposited was calculated, converted out to milligrams per liter, then you just take that times your saturation percentage, parts per million, and go from there. If I had it to do over again, I think I probably would have tried to pick either Unit 5 and Unit 6 right adjacent to each other or Unit 2 and Unit 3. What this originally was was a PhD project which was designed to also take into account groundwater interactions which, or groundwater modeling which Scott Bowman did. So basically what was an integral project was split into two master's projects. And when we did that, I think that we lost part of the inherent study design, which is causing problems now. Burn your copy of the tape, folks. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Okay, I think we all have a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks, Vic.